All right, hello folks. Welcome to EfficientML.AI Lecture 6. We are going to dive deeper into quantization, uh, the second lecture for quantization. Um, so lab one was out. Um, make sure you downloaded it. Last week, we updated our lab's group website, which is hanlab.mit.edu. And unfortunately, that disrupted one of the links of the PTH file in our homework one. So yesterday, uh, the TAs has posted on Slack the fix for that. So our original website can be still be accessed by hanlab18.mit.edu, while our new website is hanlab.mit.edu. So if you have, haven't downloaded uh, the homework one, lab one yet, you can uh, download a new one. If you, if you have already downloaded but cannot download one of the files, you can just follow um, the discussion in the check your email. So we have a fix for that. And try to be nice, we accommodate that by giving you an extra two days to, ho to finish the homework, although we just took a few hours to fix that. But we want to be lenient and give you two, uh, two more extra days. Hopefully, that doesn't cause too much distraction. If you have any questions about lab one, feel free to ping us. We have office hour every uh, Thursday after the class. So uh, in today's lecture, we'll first review the linear quantization, which we talked about in the previous lecture, followed by two very important techniques very widely used in industry and practice, which is post-training quantization, just recover the accuracy after training and without any fine tuning, which is very uh, computationally efficient. Sometimes PTQ, the post-training quantization, cannot fully recover the accuracy after quantization. Therefore, uh, we are going to introduce the QAT, the quantization aware training technique that can um, uh, recover the accuracy by fine tuning the model. Following that, we are going to go more aggressively and dive deeper into binary and ternary quantization. And if we have time, we will talk about uh, mixed precision quantization to give different precision for different layer. So this is uh, our agenda. In the last lecture, we talk about um, this floating point weight, floating point arithmetic, which is basically before quantization, uh, versus the k-means space the quantization, which can save the storage. Okay, so here we are using quantized weight, but arithmetic is still floating point. This is still quite useful. We are going to see that in our lab tool and also our uh, Llama tool deployment on a laptop, since the large language model is purely memory bounded. Computation is cheap, memory is expensive. Uh, this method can uh, be super effective uh, by compressing these large language models. We're going to revisit this uh, during our large language model lecture. Also, we introduced linear quantization for both the weight and also the activations. So the arithmetic and also the storage are both using uh, lower precision. Reviewing the k-means quantization, floating point weight, we cluster them by sharing uh, the grouping for similar weights. And we only need to store this low precision index plus the codebook. Uh, the codebook is usually much smaller than uh, the weight dimension. Imagine um, you have only four bits, so the codebook has only 16 entries compared with 1,000 by 1,000. Uh, uh, dimension in the uh, weight itself. We further show that uh, pruning and quantization can work together to further boost the compression ratio further to the left hand side, make the model much smaller while preserving the accuracy. We further described in the last lecture about the I find mapping um, for uh, linear quantization. So this is the original weight. Uh, we introduced uh, this zero point, uh, which maps the quantized weight zero point to be zero, and the 32-bit floating point number, uh, which is the scaling factor. So the scaling factor basically map the range between Q min and Q max, which is the quantized min and quantized max, uh, to the uh, real number, to the actual uh, min and max of either the weight or the activation. So for different bit width, remember we have a fixed set of Q mean 
and q max. If we have two bits, q mean is minus one to positive uh, minus two to positive one. And if the bit width is four bit, you can correspondingly find the q min q max is minus eight to positive seven. Further, we had this long derivation, which we're going to see in lab two, so make sure you master this technique pretty well. Assume the weight is symmetric, bias is symmetric, so z are zero, okay? and we define sd to be this term, and define q bias to be this term, so we can finally get this equation. Okay? So qx, or qw times qx, the quantized weight, uh, matrix multiplied with the quantized activation, plus the bias, and the rescale it, and added with uh, the integer n. Okay? So here, both QB and Q bias, since the bias is has, having a, large, a lot smaller dimension okay, compared with the weight, so we can afford it to use 32-bit to store it and to prevent overfitting the uh, accumulator accumulation in the uh, matrix multiplication are also done um, in 32-bit integer add. Similarly, for convolution, we just replace the matrix multiplication with conv, and the rest of the uh, formula looks pretty much the same. So we'll uh, give you a hands-on tutorial to walk you through this step uh, step by step in our lab two, which is going to come soon. All right, so let's talk further talk about post training quantization some details. Okay, uh, we start with about quantization granularity, followed by the dynamic range clipping. So similar. Um, to pruning, we also want to find a proper granularity of quantizing either the weight or the activation. And lastly, the rounding. So let's start with the quantization granularity. Just like pruning, remember during pruning, we had a full spectrum of pruning granularities. Remember what are the what are those granularities for pruning a CNN? Remember, we had a full spectrum from here to here, most fine-grained, most coarse-grained, right? So similar to pruning, uh, quantization also we can have different granularities. We can quantize the whole tensor, okay, the full tensor, we can quantize it using the same scaling factor, the same uh, zero point, or we can have finer granularity, like quantize each channel independently. They can have different range, different scaling factor, different uh, zero point, or we can be even more fine grained. Okay? Just quantize a group of uh, values, either per vector, or we can even share some of the exponents across uh, different numbers. So, this is the recent very popular MX, uh, MX4, MX9, etc. We're going to introduce that. So, you can imagine which one is more hardware friendly and which one is likely to give higher accuracy. Right, this one is more likely to achieve higher accuracy because you have finer granularity. You can afford to have more detailed scaling factor for uh, each sub vector, right? Well, well, this one is more coarse grained, um, so it's less probably less accurate, but more hardware friendly since uh, it's more regular. You just apply one scaling factor to the whole tensor, and probably more storage efficient since. Each sub vector you need a scaling factor of bias. Uh, here you just need a single scaling factor and a single bias. Okay. So let's dive deeper, starting with this per tensor quantization. So in per tensor quantization, uh, the R max uh, is basically um, the whole tensors uh, absolute values max uh, max of the absolute value. Okay. So um, it samples from the entire tensor. You plot the distribution, you uh, get the absolute value of each element, and you find the largest one. But as we have many different channels, say in a, in a CNN, um, just plot the uh, range of different channels. Okay? So like here we have 32 channels. 
actually different channel. What, what do you observe here about their range? It's quite different, right? Different channels are quite different. Some of them could be pretty small versus pretty big. Some of them stay within this a tiny little range, not much uh, difference. Okay? So it's pretty unfair to use just a single scaling factor, a single bias, or single uh, max value to capture uh, each channel. Okay? Therefore, uh, using a single scaling factor for the whole tensor sometimes drops, uh, incurs <coughs> accuracy drop, especially for small models. Okay, so um, there can be pretty large difference in the range of weight. This has a big range, this has a small range, and sometimes you have outlier weights. So the solution is to use per channel quantization. Uh, treat them independently. Each one has their own preferred scaling factor. So that motivated our uh, second scheme, which is per channel quantization. Give a slightly finer granularity. And let's see an uh, example okay, to uh, fortify our uh, knowledge. So two-bit linear quantization with our familiar example four by four matrix. If we are using per channel, uh, if we are using the per tensor quantization on the right hand side, this is what we learned in the last lecture. So we just find the absolute value of each element and find the max of them. And which one is that? 2.12, okay, that's the R max, the max value across the entire tensor. And then remember how did we calculate the scaling factor? So Q max, here we have how many bits? Two bits, okay, therefore um, the Q max is ranging from minus two to positive one, okay? So we can divide R max over the Q max. Q max is determined by the number of bits. Uh, so the scaling factor is 2.12. Okay, so we use this scaling factor, um, and we can get the quantized value, um, and then we multiply that, since it's symmetric, there's no bias, we can multiply that with 2.12, we can get this uh, reconstructed, um, reconstructed uh, weight. Okay, and we, if we see the difference between the original uh, W versus the quantized uh, w times the scaling factor, which is the final value, is 2.28. Can we do better using per channel quantization? So what are we going to do? How are, are we going to change the S? Yes, so R max for each row, you have your private scaling factor and R max. So we do it for the first row, this one, right? 2.09, that's the largest. Second row, even bigger, uh, R max S, S1. Third row, R max S2. Okay, they are all different. You have your private uh, scaling factor. Fourth row, this is R max, okay, R max, and the scaling factor. And we are going to use this private scaling factor to quantize each channel independently. So we get this quantized um, value and also the reconstructed um, weight matrix. And you, as you can see, they are using different scaling factors, 2.09, 2.12, 1.92, and so on. And what is the new reconstruction error? The difference? is 2.08 is indeed smaller than the original reconstruction error, which was 2.28. So what's the, uh, what is the uh, overhead here? Is that free lunch? Let's use per channel always. Right, right. You have to store more information now you have to store four uh, scaling factors. This one is actually pretty expensive. That's 32 bit. It's not cheap. Previously, you need only one. Okay? This is a simple example. Only have four channels. 
in large language models, you can easily have 10,000 channels. 10,000 channels, you have to store 10,000 32 bit 14 point weights. That gets non trivial. And did you observe some difference between the quantized weight here and here? This one and this guy. Some of you may saw this is minus one. Okay? All the previous values are the same, but only this one is different. And what caused this subtle difference between the vector quant uh, the, between this per channel versus per tensor quantization? So previously, this uh, this minus one corresponds is uh, minus one point oh three. During the per tensor quantization, um, the scaling factor is 2.12. So this number divided by 2.12, the absolute value is smaller than uh, 0 0.5. Therefore, it's quantized to 0. Since it's smaller than 0 0.5, it's rounded to 0. But using per channel quantization, okay, this number is going to div divide by what? 1.92. Right? And it's large, the absolute value is larger than 0 0.5. Therefore, it's rounded. Um, the absolute value is minus uh, is one. Okay, and we can see the subtle difference. Obviously, this is more probably better than just ignoring this number and treat it as zero. But we can treat it as minus one. All right. So can we do even smaller? Right. So. This method, this per channel quantization, works super well for vision models. Like this is what we solved last year lecture. We, we don't have this. We can just go home. Unfortunately, large language models came roughly November uh, in the fall of last year, and then we experimented with the per channel quantization. I actually find if you want to go to lower bit, that is not enough. If you want to go to four bit, we need to go even uh, finer granularity by using uh, even smaller group size. Even within a channel, we want to further divide it into like here two parts. We have sub uh, vector, so we are going to introduce a vector quantization. And an even more complicated version by Microsoft, which is the MX data type, uh, shared micro exponent MX data type. This is completely new for this year's uh, lecture. So we are going to introduce one more scaling factor. Previously, we talked about um, each, um, uh, each tensor, we have a scaling factor for each tensor. Now we want to have another scaling factor for each sub-vector. It may not be as, as big as a whole channel, like large language model channel could be 10,000, pretty big. So for every like 32, 16 or 128, or 64, 32, 16, 128, those are the most commonly used vector size. We have a dedicated private um, scaling factor for each uh, sub vector, okay? which is uh, forming this kind of hierarchical scaling factor. Right? First hierarchy, second hierarchy. Okay? Very coarse grain. The in fact are shared by the entire tensor versus finer grained shared by this every group of 32 values. So since this gamma is shared, it's very uh, low overhead. You can amortize overhead. This could be a 32-bit or FT16 high precision uh, coarse grained scale factor. Well, um, this per vector, like every 16 elements, you don't want to have a super high precision. So uh, this sometimes has lower precision. So that achieve it's usually always a balance uh, between the accuracy and the efficiency, right? The finer granularity go, the higher the accuracy, but the more redundancy, larger overhead. So let's calculate the memory overhead uh, using an example. Given 
a four bit quantization okay, with a four bit per vector scaling factor for every 16 elements. What is the effective bit width? Four bit quantization width, so each element has four bits. Okay? And every 16 element, they share a four bit scaling factor. Every 16 elements, they share a four bit scaling factor. So each element uh, equivalently has a quarter bits. So four plus a quarter, that's four and a quarter bits. So that's the way uh, to see the effective number of bits. So we can have a more general representation here with this multi-level scaling scheme. Okay, so this is an indiv individual weight. Um, we have this pre equation previously with a single scaling factor. Now we can have level zero, level one, on and so on, multi-level of scaling factors, where r is the real number value, q is the quantized value, z is a zero point mapping, uh, q, uh, mapping z to zero, and s is the scaling factor. Previously, we introduced this per-channel quantization. Okay, so this per-channel quantization, each data is into four. Um, the group size for the first level is like entire channel share one FT16 uh, scaling factor. And there is no L1 scaling factor, just one single level. VS quant okay, introduced another level, second, uh, second level, which the first level is still this individual. Um, uh, the first level is basically every 16 element is going to share the iron signed into four scaling factor. And then the entire channel is going to share another FT16 scaling factor. Okay, so we have uh, two levels of scaling factor. First level, unsigned in four, shared by every 16 elements. Okay, every 16 elements, four, but imagine this is 16. And then uh, uh, FT16 scaling factor shared by the entire channel. So what is the effective bits uh, per weight? rather than four, now we have four plus four-bit scaling factor shared by 16 values. Did we miss something? Actually, we ignored this scaling factor, which is shared for the entire channel, which is 4,000, 10,000. So that's so small, so we just ignored it. And very recently, Microsoft proposed this MX uh, data type. Okay, so um, it's slightly um, more complicated, uh, still having two levels of scaling factor. Uh, the first level, uh, actually, the data type is S1, uh, Mantisa 4, Mantisa 2. So depending on if it's MX4, MX6, or MX9. Okay, yeah, MX4, one sign bit, and you have two uh, bit of Mantisa. Where's the exponent? The exponent is here. We have one bit of exponent shared by two values. So for uh, MX9, you have one bit of exponent also shared by um, two values. And next, every 16 elements, you are going to have another eight bits of exponent to increase the dynamic range. Every 16 elements you have 8-bit of um, uh, exponent to control and expand the dynamic range. So the difference between MX4, MX6, and MX9 is that it has different precision, different Mantisa bit. So remember in the last lecture, we talked about FP16 and FP8, uh, which is available in transformer engine in H100. Um, each number has their own exponent. But the difference here is that two elements share one exponent. And further, 16 elements share another high precision exponent. So why this is called MX9? You have eight bits here, right? One sign bit and eight bit Mantisa. Uh, you have one exponent bit shared by two values. 
so that effectively, how much, how many, half, right? And then you have eight bits shared by 16 values. So effectively, you have another half. Half, half, eight, all together you have nine. That's why it's called MX9 here. All right, this is getting popular uh, representation in large language models, so I do want to cover that number representation. And this could be an active research uh, topic, like how to share, how to not to share, what is the hierarchy, what is um, going to be um, the, the precision for each hierarchy. There's pretty, uh, it's a pretty large design space. I think if you want to find an open project, that could be one of the project idea to explore whether you can design your own data type that give a good trade-off between the accuracy and also the hardware efficiency especially for modern uh, large uh, model workloads. Okay, now let's switch gear to the second part, which is um, clipping, clipping the dynamic range. We mentioned this dynamic range, oh, question here. Last slide one, because it would be fair to say that trade-off across those different uh, DSQ and the DMXs would be in the weights you want to represent. How much very how much scale variation is there versus how much consistent variation is there? Uh, so you can see the exponent bit, eight bit, yeah, all one bit, all eight bit. The dynamic range is pretty much the same. Like here, the precision is different. The mantisa bit is a key difference. But the mantisa would be the range uh, in the weights. How, how much consistent is there? Right, right. Exactly. exactly. Since the range matters a lot, how do we select the, um, the range, especially for activations? Weights are easy, right? Weight is static. No matter what input it is, the weight stays the same. But different images, they may have completely different data. So how do we find the range for the activations? So our first method is during training time. Okay, we can have this exponential, uh, ex exponential moving average. We track the exp exponential moving average during training. For example, after every epoch, we check the RME and IMAX, RMAX for this uh, particular batch, and we run uh, this uh, combination of. Uh, T minus one T to update uh, the range of T, including both the mean and max. So this is smooth across thousands of training epochs. Getting factor is alpha. So this is during training. We can also calculate um, this R mean and R max by at, at runtime. So we collect a calibration data set which is separate from the training and the validation, so, which is separate from the test data set. Okay, this calibration batch, um, we can calculate uh, the mean and the max. Uh, for example, we can using uh, the average of the mean and max, and we can also find the max of the max. We can also have a smarter way to determine um, how to um, get the statistics from this calibration set. And one of the heuristic is assume, this is just assume, if the activation follows the Gaussian or Laplacian distribution, then we can have this closed form um, dynamic range to clip it. So first of all, the intuition is that if you clip too much, the larger weight, the larger activation, we have a large quantization error. But if you don't clip here, you will have very sparsely scattered centroids. You're wasting the centroids, for example, here. Centroid here probably is more uh, useful. So if you have a uh, Laplacian distribution, you can have this closed form uh, determination about where to clip, Determined on, depends on how many bits do we have. What if the distribution is non Gaussian or non Laplacian. A super widely used method 
actually that's the method used in NVIDIA's TensorRT uh, toolbox is using this KL divergence uh, to find the best location to clip it. If you clip it here, if you clip too, uh, too far to the left, you may have a large error for these uh, activations. But if you clip here, you are wasting the centroids on these uh, small distribution, um, uh, distribu these values, which has very small amount of percentage. Okay. So uh, we want to optimize the location of the uh, of the clipping by finding the uh, by optimizing the KL divergence. One is before the clipping. One is after the clipping. Uh, P log P over Q. And the uh, intuition is that this KL divergence measures the amount of information loss okay, when approximating a, a potential uh, a, a given uh, encoding. Okay, before clipping, we have a distribution. After encoding, we have another distribution. We want to make them similar and minimize the loss of information. And let's see what happens after clipping the ResNet-152, this particular layer. And we find that the KL divergence determines to clip right here. So what happens to these two distributions? This is original distribution P. This is distribution Q. We see a point here. Why is this point here? All the points to the right of this clipping line. I guess rounded to this this value, okay, and put them together, you have a pretty large number of them. So that's why we have abrupt change here. And KL divergence is basically trying to uh, optimize P and Q to minimize the information loss. Here are more examples. What happens with clipping? AlexNet after putting layer two to here. Um, this is Google Net after clipping it, clipping ranges here. Resident 152 clipped it here. Um, this is a pretty interesting distribution. Google Net clipped it here. They are all different. So recently NVIDIA proposed another approach to find the best clipping. Okay, so there's animation here. Um, there is a trade-off. Okay, if um, actually it's better to see uh, from this animation where if the clip is the absolute value is too large, um, you have very uh, a big waste wasting your centroids on the um, distribution where actually not many number is using. Uh, this value. Okay, but if you are clipping too aggressively, these values representation will be inaccurate. So that's why if we uh, plot the clipping scalar from the smallest one to the largest one. Okay, so now it's the smallest one, now it's the largest one. Okay. Um, as you go from a large one to a small one, you can see the MIC, the mean square error, First, a decrease. Why a decrease first? When we are doing this, why the MIC first decrease? Because initially, if you clip here, we are wasting a lot of centroid to these locations where actually not many weights or activations are choosing this value versus it's more uh, useful to put them here. But later, as you um, clip too aggressively, the error is going to increase again. Because here, as you, as you clip too aggressively, all these blue area will be clipped to the middle. So that causes pretty big uh, error. So there is an optimal point, which can be an analytically solved. And using this approach, like ResNet, MobileNet, and BERT, uh, they can be 
they can have a decent accuracy, even aggressively quantizing them to only four bits, which is pretty impressive. Okay, so that's about clipping. Now let's switch gear to talk about rounding. What is the simplest rounding compared with 0 and, uh, 0 0.5? 0 0.4, you, you round it to 0. 0 0.6, you round it to 1. But is that the op optimal? Like here, previously, uh, 0 0.3 is 0. 0. 0.5 is 1. 0 0.7 is 1. 0 0.3 is 0. Okay, so that's the rounding to nearest. But rounding to nearest is not optimal. Okay? Um, because the weights are correlated with each other. The best rounding for each weight is not the best for the whole tensor. So we want to consider the whole tensor rather than individual weights. So we want to optimize this rounding scheme to see uh, to consider whole tensor's effect by trying to match the activation before and after rounding. Okay, since the activation is end to end, uh, the final um, result, we care. We don't care the individual weights whether the approximation error is large or not, but we care the output activation. Okay, so we want to um, is one possible quantization result or, or rounding result is actually we rounded. Zero and a half to zero, rather than one. So, how do we do that? We actually add a learnable delta to each weight. The delta ranges between uh, zero and one. Looks like my Zoom, the internet in this classroom is not quite good. So, unfortunately, the streaming might be interrupted. Unfortunately, we have the recording over there. about that Let me, okay there we go so um, this delta is a learnable factor and, and I try to project this learnable v to something between 0 and 1 and what is the most widely used method that is the rectified sigmoid which can project a value to 0 and 1 so the original W is added to this learnable uh, value that is between 0 and 1. And we try to minimize the difference between the original Wx, which is output, versus W plus H, plus H times X. Finally, we have this regularization term, which encourages this HV to be binary. Okay, so let's sum up a little bit. Um, we we'll continue to talk about several concepts here. Uh, zero point was covered the last uh, last lecture, and then we talk about the granularity of scaling is per tensor, um, per channel, or even group, our uh, vector quantization. Then we talk about clipping and rounding. Uh, clipping, we have several methods. We can do it in tweening, having the exponential moving average. We can do it at inference time to minimize the KO divergence or minimize the mean square error. Uh, we talk about rounding either round to nearest or using this other round, this learnable rounding method. Let's take a five minute break and then we continue our discussion. Okay, hello folks, welcome back. So we talk about uh, the dynamic range clipping and rounding. And now let's uh, talk about the next chapter about. Okay, now let's continue to talk about quantization aware tweening. So, usually, if you directly quantize a model, the accuracy is going to drop. Right? So, we want to fine tune the model to recover the loss of accuracy with quantization aware tweening. So to minimize the loss of accuracy, uh, especially when we are aggressively quantizing them to very low precision, like four bits, fine tuning is very necessary. In this example, uh, we quantize them to only two bits by using the k-means quantization. 
uh, this is the index, this is the centroid. Uh, we can back propagate to get the gradient and group them together and put the weight, a gradient with the same color corresponding to each group. Um, and then reduce them and then multiplied by the learning rate subtracted from the original centroid. So that's one round of stochastic gradient descent. And let's take a look, a deeper look at a computation graph. This is layer n minus one. Uh, this is layer n, this is layer n plus one. And this is the forward in black. And the purple is in the, back, uh, is in the backward. And for this particular uh, layer n, we have uh, the floating point copy. Okay? So the full precision copy of the weight is always maintained uh, throughout the twinning, no matter if it's k-means or if it is um, um, normal uh, linear quantization. Okay? And that is needed because we want to accumulate those small errors during quantization. Although at this iteration, say a number is zero, but say you went through five uh, iterations, each iteration the gradient is 0 0.1. So after five iterations, this weight becomes 0 0.5. And it will be rounded to one. So that's why it's important to keep a floating point weight in the back during training to accumulate these subtle changes. Many accu accumulating many subtle changes might lead uh, to changing uh, the actual quantization bucket. So once the model is trained, we no longer need this floating point uh, value in the back. And we can directly quantize it and use the quantized value at runtime. Is it possible to be a little bit more confident in the actual computer errors that you can get? So you're checking what output the quantized weight produced versus the output the actual weight produced? That might be that the case. Because if you said errors might accumulate, so what's the actual? Uh, not error about accumulating, but the changes are accumulating. Say every time, for example, currently the weight is zero, and the gradient times the learning rate is only 0 0.1. Then after one iteration, if you don't keep the floating point weight, 0 0.1 will be rounded to zero. So next time you always also start with zero. So you lose the losses. Although it seems small, but after five iterations, each one is 0 0.1. After five iterations, you can 0 0.5. Now it will be drawn to one. So that's why it's important to keep small changes. It's similar to every day you learn a little bit, but after like a period of time, you get a pretty subtle, a pretty big change. You actually want the small change. You want the small change. Not the error change. Correctness. Correctness accumulate. So that's the weight. How about the activation? So we want to insert this quantization node, uh, this quantization computing node. Uh, after layer n, you, uh, at the forward time, you want to turn it into a quantized value before feeding to layer n plus 1. Okay, so here we call this scheme uh, simulated or fake quantization. Why is it called fake quantization? Because we are still maintaining the floating point weight in the back during training. Um, and also for all the data paths here, it's still at P16 or at P32. Because the value is, for example, one, but it's still represented, one, two, three, are still represented using floating point number. So that when you are doing back propagation, you can uh, capture those small subtle changes. Uh, here, make sure we have this uh, activation quantization computing node to ensure that discrete valued weights and activations are in the boundaries. The boundary here be before you pass to the next layer. So let's see a concrete example. Right, if full precision weights are used, what is missing? 
So we will remove this part. Then we are directly using the full precision weight to multiply with the input. So this is the full precision weight maintained in the back, and this is the quantization function. Say this, this is 1.2, after quantization, here it becomes 1. So actually, 1 is passed to the network during inference time. And if you get a gradient, which is 0 0.1, you don't add it to 1, but you add it to 1.2. Uh, so training has forward and backward, right? So this is, first of all, the, the model has already converged, you quantize it, and then you want to fine-tune it to recover the accuracy. And during fine-tuning, you have the forward phase and also the backward phase. During the forward phase, for this RP32 weight, um, that this is RP32 representation. But actually, this might already be quantized to like an integer value, like uh, 2.0, right? Um, and then you are using the quantization function to turn it into a integer value. Uh, whatever gradient you get here, you accumulate it over this 2.0. So it may become 2.1, 2.3, um, and so on. Yeah, let's give an example, right? So say you have previous, you just imagine you have only one weight. Okay, so previously the weight would be like 2.4. Okay, and after PTQ, post training quantization, which we learned previously, the value is quantized to 2. Okay, and we want to capture those small changes. Say the gradient is 0 0.1. Now you want to capture this 0 0.1. So after one iteration, this weight becomes 2.1. If you don't have this floating 32 copy, but always use integer copy, you are never going to capture this 0 0.1. It's going to be run into 2 again. But if you have this 0 0.1, what do you do in the forward time? You quantize this value again to 2. You forward, you get a gradient. Maybe you get another gradient, which is 0 0.1. Okay, and what do you do here? You add it to the FP32 copy in the back, so that becomes 2.2. At forward time again, you quantize this 2.2 to 2. You forward again. You may get another gradient, which is 0 0.1. So you update the FP32. Copy in the back, you get 2.3. After a while, it may become 2.5. Say after five iterations. And now you want to do the quantize quantization, that becomes three. So that finally updated this weight. You mean why you want to do the Forward using the quantized value. Yeah, what do you right? do that? that simulates using the integer to run the inference. And what is the loss? And use that loss to calculate the gradient. So you use this tool, which is if, if you deploy it on hardware, you're going to use this value to run inference and calculate the loss. You're not going to use 2.2 because actual deployment time, we are using the quantized value. <coughs> It's possible. It's indeed. Say the, the gradient is not 0 0.1, but sometimes it's minus 0 0.1. It's highly possible.
then once you remove it, you can uh, we'll put it back on the deposit. Uh, we are going to uh, visit that during on-device training. Um, but so far, this is the method people widely use for fine-tuning a quantized model. The detailed dynamics, maybe uh, you can craft some handcrafted example. That could be a very interesting final product to export. People are. There are people training from scratch a quantized model. But that one is roughly in 2016. That is very widely used. But nowadays, people train floating point always to converge and then quantize it using PTQ and then QAT to fine tune it. That's the standard like flowing industry. Floating point. All right, so let's move on. Uh, uh, here, let's review some notations. We call this matrix to be QW, since this is the original weight, this is the quantized weight. Um, and after this reconstruction, by subtracting the zero point multiplied with the scaling factor, we call this QW. That's what you see here, the difference in notation. Uh, this is, can be represented in integer. This is still represented in Floating point. So here we are going to have QW and QY. They are represented actually by floating point number. But that already incorporated the impact of quantization. But just here we have subtracted the bias and multiplied with the scaling factor to let the neural network know, oh, I have done something to the to the model. So this is the model you are going to. This is the weight you are going to use. For inference, not this one, although they are pretty similar. But here we are not using this because these two, the absolute uh, L2 norm differences are actually quite big. We are using this one after uh, this quantization node for both the weight and the deactivation. Okay, so how should the gradients back propagate through the simulated is fake? Quantization. Uh, if you have the chain rule, uh, the partial QW is partial W is actually zero because this is the quantization. This is the W, this is the QW. It's flat everywhere, but it jumps. Um, so the GW, partial uh, loss over partial W equal to partial loss over partial QW and partial QW over partial W. Since this one, the gradient is zero everywhere except for these abrupt changes. The gradient is not going to flow. So a very commonly used method is to use this STE, the straight through estimator, uh, assuming the gradient is one everywhere. So in that case, we can directly use the partial loss over partial uh, QW to calculate the GW. So here, um, this is the um, partial loss over partial GW. So I directly use that to update W. Okay, similarly uh, for the Y, uh, we also use this uh, straight through estimator to directly pass the gradient through this block. Assuming uh, here is just one, the gradient uh, multiplier is one here, it's one here. So we can directly flow the gradient in this way and also flow the gradient in this way. If you are using the floating point weight in the back, uh, in the uh, what is the question exactly? So we're taking we only take gradients. Why is it a matter of 
oh, we are not treating it as uh, as this way, but ignore that part. So in, in here, we are directly passing the gradient to here. So you treat it as a floating point. So you don't have that problem. So make sure you distinguish between this QW and also this QW. This is in the integer space. It ranges from minus 128 to positive 127. But here, the weights are usually small. It ranges from like minus 2.5 to minus uh, to uh, plus 2.12, for example. They are in two different spaces. And we are passing the gradient through this space. And assuming the gradient between this one is this one is what? Right, that's exactly what we treated. We treated as if there's no uh, such uh, conversion in the middle. I directly use whatever gradient flow it back to the oh, to I the see. weights. So this is uh, yes. Uh, one, two, three. Right. Right. So let's see. After quantization aware tweening, the accuracy can be improved a lot. Uh, for pretensor, it's more um, apparent from 0 0.1 accuracy to 70% accuracy. And for per channel, uh, the original accuracy you can imagine per channel quantization is better than pretensor quantization. But after um, this fine tuning, quantization aware training, the accuracy improved from 59 to 70.7. .7. And as a result, um, after a uh, quantization QAT, uh, the accuracy is pretty much roughly catched up with the original accuracy. Okay, so we want to go one step further um, to continue compress the model using binary and ternary weights and using fit wise operations. And let's see how does binary and ternary quantization works. Can we push? the quantization precision to only one bit. So let's review, this is a normal case, 32-bit weight, 32-bit activation, I multiply them together. Uh, both the input and the weight are real numbers, FP32 or FP16 representation. We can change the weight to make it binary. Okay, so just look at the sign, if it is positive, then it's one, if it is negative, then it's minus one. In that case, the memory is 32 times smaller, and the computation is uh, uh, two times smaller, since uh, one of the operand is uh, either positive one or minus one, so you don't have to do any multiplication, just only addition. We can do um, either deterministic binarization, like what we did just now, just look at the sign. If it is larger than zero, it's positive. If it is smaller than zero, then it's negative. We can also do so stochastic binarization. Okay, so it's positive one with probability p equal to sigma r. Okay, what is the sigma? So this is the step function. If it is below minus one, it's always zero. If it's above one, uh, above one, it's always one. In the middle, that's linear. So if you are here, 100% you are 1. If you are here, you are 100% you are 0. In the middle, you have the linear uh, interpolation between 1 and 0. It can be rounded either to 1, uh, positive 1, or minus 1. So this is our familiar weight matrix. We can binarize them uh, by just look at the, uh, um, the sign or using the stochastic, stochastic rounding. The difference is actually pretty big. So the accuracy drop is very heavy. You can imagine changing them to um, only one bit. And how can we do better here? We have this scaling factor, right? So we can use this scaling factor, uh, try to align uh, the average of the, uh, of the absolute value, right? So here, we are multiply that with a scaling factor, 1.05. And how do we calculate that scaling factor? So the scaling factor alpha equal to the average 
of the uh, absolute um, the absolute value. We just sum up all the absolute value and divide it by 16. Um, so we use that, we okay, use that, 1 over 16, uh, our norm, uh, to multiply with the uh, alpha. And we can see uh, after that, um, the accuracy is actually improved a little bit. So actually this alpha is quite crucial during uh, binarization of neural nets. Can we do even more aggressively by not only quantizing the weight, but also the activation uh, to only one bit? So in this case, we have uh, the weight, activation, weight, activation, etc. Everything is minus two. So can we have a, uh, what is the analogy between this binary multiplication versus x nor? You can see uh, one times one is one, one times minus one is minus one, etc. Uh, but if we are doing x nor, if they are the same, it's one. If they are different, one zero or zero one, then it's zero. If they are the same, zero zero, it's a one. Did you see find some similarity between the result here versus the result there? Try to see the color. We can assume everything is minus um, minus one, right? If the x nor result is a one, we can add a two to the base. If the base everywhere minus one, minus one, minus one. If the x nor value is one, then we actually add a two. So that's exactly here. Um, the original result x nor one is one, zero x nor one is zero, etc. The relationship is assume all the re result is minus one. Then if you sum them up together, it's minus four. And how many nine zeros you have here? Okay. Um, whenever you have a nine zero in the x nor, you add a two. So comparing here um, and here, um, sorry, comparing here and here, actually you are adding uh, two on top of minus one. Assuming if everything is minus one, if suddenly you have a one here, or you're adding two. So you just count the number of nine zeros, which you have one nine zero, you multiply it by two and add it to the base, which is assuming everything is minus one. You have four of them, then it's minus four. And you count the number of nine zeros in the x nor, you have one of them, and you multiply uh, you uh, multiply by two, that gives you the same result uh, when you are calculating using the binary arithmetic. Give you one minute to think about it. Make sure you are convinced. We can calculate the sum of several x norms in this way. Right? If the x nor is zero, if the x nor is zero, it's minus one. Only if the x nor is one, then it's positive one. So the difference is two. That's why we have we are counting the number of nine zeros and then multiply by two, add it to the number where assuming everything is minus one. So that is the basic equation, calculating it using the x nor equation, uh, multiply by two and uh, add it to minus n, assuming everything is minus one. So plug it in, uh, we can do the math here. And then this summation is mapping, can be mapped to a very efficient hardware operation called pop count. Basically given an array of numbers, and return the number of ones in this array. That's called pop count. So put it, put it here, um, the arithmetic of two binary vectors to do the dot product can be simplified by minus n plus pop count x nor uh, left shifted 
by one, meaning multiply by two. And everything here is very hard, very efficient operations. How count counting the number of um, uh, counting the number of ones, shift, um, uh, uh, addition. Those are all very cheap operations. There is no multiplication. And using that, um, we can calculate this dot product. 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1 dot product with this value. Uh, we can basically uh, use the equation, turn it into an XNOR operation. Uh, XNOR operation is very easy to calculate in hardware. And this is XNOR operation. We run the pop count. 1 and 0, this is 1, multiplied by 1, multiplied by 2. And then multiply with the base, assuming everything is minus one. You have four of them. That's why here is minus four. You get the result minus two. Okay, so let's see the accuracy. The XNOR net um, slightly better than the uh, BN uh, binary neural net. Mm, almost still cannot catch up with uh, the binary weight only. Binary weight only you can pretty much recover the accuracy, uh, but XNORnet is giving a pretty big improvement on top of the binarized neural network with the, um, without, uh, without the scaling factors. We can go um, another approach to introduce a zero in the weight. Okay, since uh, during pruning lecture, we find actually zero is a very important value. We can skip it. Uh, if it's just zero multiplied, anything is zero. But here we need to use two bits to represent them. Actually, weights in one slot. So we can either round it by using a fixed threshold. If the value is larger than threshold, it's positive RT. If it is smaller than this threshold, it's negative RT. Uh, if it is in the middle, it's zero. And this threshold can be uh, can have a heuristic like 0 0.7, the expectation. And why is 0 0.7 is pretty much uh, just heuristic. Given this matrix, we can calculate uh, 0 0.7 times the, the uh, average uh, uh, average absolute value is getting the threshold about 0 0.73. Then we can compare with that. If it's larger than 0 0.73, it's a 1. Smaller than minus 0 0.73, it's minus 1. And in between, that will be 0. And again, we ha have this scaling factor, the average uh, value of those non zeros. Um, and we can find using this uh, ternary weight net, we can have a higher accuracy compared with the binary weight net. And here, the tricky part is why do we have uh, this RT and this strange heuristic 0 0.7? Can we have a learnable, um, learnable solution? So here we can uh, indeed have this learnable solution. Uh, we can have the positive value and negative value to be different. Um, and in this way, we can further improve the accuracy a little bit to push the frontier for uh, ternary weight, uh, train the ternary quantization. So put them together, uh, we covered both the 8-bit, 4-bit, and even the binary and ternary. Uh, quantization. And the most important uh, important thing to keep in mind is that computation is cheap. Memory reference is expensive. Uh, so as you go deeper and deeper uh, quantize the model, you have diminishing return. Because from 8-bit to 2-bit, you get four times less memory. But how much reduction of compute do we have? 16 times. So computing is quadratic with the number of bits. So reduce gradual, uh, aggressively reducing the precision is giving you linear return for the memory, but quadratic return, uh, return on the compute saving. Since compute is more expensive, you get diminishing return as you go deeper and deeper uh, quantized model. And so far we find four bit is pretty much a sweet spot. All right, just like different layer of pruning, they have different sensitivity. Similarly for quantization, that is always also the case. So we will introduce mixed precision quantization to allocate different weight, a different number of precisions 
for different layer. Okay, so this is the weight, this is activation. Now we are using 8 bits to represent different layers. Uh, very homogeneous, 8 bit everywhere. But mixed precision quantization is saying some of the layers are less sensitive quantization, then we can use more aggressive quantization. Some of the layers are very sensitive to quantization, so we'd better use uh, less aggressive quantization, and so on. So there are, this is a pretty big design space. You have eight choices for the weight, assuming one to eight bits. Eight bit for activations, also assuming one to eight bits. You have 16 choices for each layer. You have n layers, so you have 16 to the power, 64 to the power of n uh, number of choices. That's pretty huge. So again, we used this RL method of active critique, um, and also have the hardware mapping, how to map this mixed precision model onto a hardware, collect the direct feedback, including the latency and also the energy to generate the state and also the award. And then the app critic is going to propose another action in the next iteration. And as a result, compared with uniformly uh, reducing um, the precision, this uh, hardware aware quantization by using mixed precision can get a better trade off between the latency versus the accuracy, just like pruning. For other metrics like model size, latency, and also the energy, uh, this mixed precision quantization can consistently outperform this uniform uh, quantization. But only catch is here. Here is that that require more engineering effort. You have to uh, deal with the compiler, the tool chain to effectively use uh, exploit this mixed precision quantization, which is quite non-trivial. So in practice, in industry, people use very coarse-grained uh, precision. For example, only for all the comp layer, you use one precision. For all the FC layer, you use one precision. To, treat, to balance between the en engineering complexity versus the performance. Very interestingly, um, on the edge device and the cloud device, this RO agent find different quantization scheme. Like for the edge, it allocated fewer bits for the depth-wise layer. Maybe due to the depth-wise layer is very memory bounded. Um, it has very little compute. So it allocated fewer bits for that. And point-wise layer, this one by one convolution, allocated more bits. All right, so in summary of today's lecture, we introduced two very important concepts and Two, uh, and followed by two uh, fun uh, concepts, but not that important. Most important probably is the post training quantization and also the quantization where uh, training, we introduce the different quantization granularities per tensor, uh, per vector, per channel, and also group quantization, especially group quantization. You want to have a deep understanding for that since that's the method very widely used for large language model quantization. Below four bits, you have to use uh, group quantization with multiple uh, levels of scaling factor. And also how to determine the dynamic range, how to clip it, how to round it. Followed by this quantization aware training. Uh, remember this straight through, uh, STE, straight through loss. You always have CFP32 copy in the back when you are doing quantization aware training. Following this rule, um, you want to always keep this floating point value in the hope that after some, a while, uh, the bucket, quantization bucket is going to change. Binary and ternary quantization, not quite widely used in industry these days because you have dim diminishing return going uh, fewer than uh, four bits. But this pop count and XNOR is pretty interesting idea. Uh, people use it to uh, make a startup, very interesting, and acquired by Apple. So very interesting technique. Uh, and also mixed precision quantization uh, to further exploit all the uh, um, redundancies in different layers. So when you have uh, different layers like uh, VI, uh, like transformer layer, C, uh, convolution layer, FC layer, you may consider using this technique. Here are some references for today, and that's all for today's lecture. Thank you.